Hello everyone, UXW Bill here once again with a video about some video equipment. Specifically, I'll be talking about two things in this video. A camcorder in the bag that you see right there, and underneath it, a very uncommon VCR. Let's go ahead and take a look at the camcorder first. The camcorder in question is a Sony Handycam CCD-TR91 model. This is a Video 8 camcorder. Near as I can tell, it dates from about 1993 or so. Ordinarily, I wouldn't make a video about a camcorder, but this one is something special. I would imagine that if this was not Sony's top-of-the-line model in the early 1990s, that it had to be very close to. And the previous owners seem to have taken excellent care of this machine. It still works 100% perfectly. Let's take a look at some of the features on this, both some of the common features and some of the more interesting ones. One of the things that you'll notice right away is that this camcorder is equipped with a stereo microphone. It's capable of recording high fidelity audio onto a Video 8 tape. There is also support for a remote control that allows you to zoom in, zoom out, start and stop the camcorder, and work some of the video playback functions. You can see the opening for the lens over here, which actually has a built-in shutter on it that operates automatically depending upon where the mode door is set. Over on the side, near the cassette basket, there is a place to plug in a microphone and condenser microphones are supported as there is a notation for Sony's plug-in power system. As with many other camcorders, there's a place to connect video and audio outputs. However, this one has an interesting twist because not only can you connect video and audio outputs, there is also a power connection for an optional RF modulator. This would allow you to connect this camcorder directly to a television that is not equipped with its own set of AV inputs or a VCR plugged into the television set that would have them. Over here is an LANC remote control jack. This allows you to connect either a wired remote control system or a synchronization system to this particular camcorder. And then you can plug in a set of headphones for monitoring during playback or recording while you are operating this camcorder. There's a carrying strap here on the back and then there is a location for the battery. Now I received a number of batteries with this camcorder, all of them nickel cadmium types. Unfortunately none of them were very good. Luckily I also received the AC adapter with this. Perhaps the most amazing thing about this camcorder, I've seen a couple uh, other variations of these early 1990s Video 8 Handycams, and the thing that I have noticed is the vast majority of them do not work properly. Either they have tape mechanism problems, or they have suffered some form of electronic failure, most probably bad capacitors, which will usually manifest itself in garbage showing up in the viewfinder and an inability to record or play anything back to tape. But as I mentioned previously, this unit works perfectly and it's got a ton of features. On top, you'll find the usual eject control to open the tape basket. This actually opens from the top and then the door pops out behind the hand strap, so make sure you don't have your hand in the way if you ever operate one of these. Then there is a wide angle and telephoto control to adjust how far you are zoomed in while you're shooting video. The playback controls on this unit can be kind of hard to find, so if you ever find one like this, don't do like I did, forget where they're located, and then spend an embarrassing amount of time looking for them before you finally remember that there is an opening flap here that reveals all of the playback controls. There are other hidden controls on this unit as well. There is a second record start stop switch behind the viewfinder. This unit also contains a rather primitive menu that allows you to adjust certain settings. On top of the unit is another control that allows you to specify two types of fades. You can fade in or out from black, or you can do a rather amusing mosaic fader, in, again, in or out on your videos. You can also choose to have the date and time if you have set this unit's clock superimposed on your video. However, you cannot choose both of them at one time. This liquid crystal display shows you how much battery life you have left. It also alternates between showing you a tape counter, the date, or the time, depending upon which one you have selected. Below the date and time buttons is a reset button that allows you to set the counter back to zero, 
should you need to do so. And then down here at the very bottom edge of the camcorder is a near and far focus control for when the unit is operating in the manual focus mode. Now you might ask yourself, how do I get this unit into manual focus mode? Well, it's not too hard once you know what to do. Again, the theme here when Sony was designing this seems to have been hidden controls. Where can we put them? Behind this auto lock slider, which is actually a mode switch, are buttons to allow you to enable manual focus and to choose one of several automatic exposure program modes. There is another feature on this camcorder that I must say is quite unique and unexpected for a nearly 20 year old machine and that is the presence of the steady shot option. I have shot some video with this camcorder and I've got to say the steady shot option on this thing works extremely well even when you're fully zoomed in and of course there is a 10 times optical zoom provided on this unit. There's not a whole heck of a lot here on the bottom other than the nameplate and the serial number and things like that. There's a mounting point for a tripod and there's also a place, if I can get it open here, of course I'd figure that this wouldn't work the first time, where you can actually put a backup battery to keep the time, date, and tape counter memories intact. If you do not have that battery there, the unit will not remember its settings. The previous owners obtained a number of Sony accessories with the camcorder. There is, of course, the power supply and battery charger that everyone would have got. This operates in two different ways. When you slide the switch over to charge, you can place a battery on this pad right here, and the charger will, of course, charge it. If you set the switch over to the VTR mode, you can run the camera from AC power and the AC power is delivered to the camcorder by this plate at the end of a long cord. This is actually a sort of fake battery and in fact it mounts on the camcorder exactly the way that a battery would. Of course the strap is kind of in the way and when the uh, fake battery is installed if the power supply is turned on you'll notice that the display down here has lit up with a counter value. Other accessories that the previous owners got this is not a genuine Sony accessory. This is just some random multiple brand uh, universal battery charger and refresher and a so-called DC converter. And yes, it has a set of DC outputs on the bottom of it. There are a couple other interesting things in here. The remote control for this particular machine. A Sony wall charger, which would allow you to charge a battery. Or again, you could refresh a battery with this, probably just a charge and a discharge and a recharge cycle. But this unit's compact nature precludes it from actually powering the camcorder. Let's see what else is in here. Ah, yes. This is the special RF modulator, and you can see right away how this would work. There are connections for the audio and video here. You get just monophonic audio, which is typical of most RF modulators. The vast majority of them do not take advantage of televisions that could play MTS stereo audio, even when the source is capable of delivering it. But in the middle here, you will see there is a Stinger-style connector that allows this unit to tap power from the camcorder. On the back, there are FCC notifications, tells you how much supply voltage is called for, though not the polarity. So you could probably, with a little bit of care and experimentation, use this on some other device. But you also get a control that allows you to choose whether the channel output is at channel 3 or channel number 4, depending upon which one is not broadcasting in your area. I got a couple of tapes with this camcorder. It seems that the last time it was used, by its previous owner was sometime in 1998 or so. Most of the tapes are incredibly boring meetings. I don't think there's anything exciting in this front pouch. Well, there's not too much. <laughs> there's documentation for a Samsung uh, camera of some kind. And of course, the universal charger that you saw just a moment ago, which is capable of operation in the car or in your house from line power. I don't remember there being anything in these side compartments other than videotapes. Here are two of the Video 8, these are actually Hi8 tapes that came with this particular camcorder. And while you're probably not supposed to do that, in all honesty, all of the 8mm video tape formats from Sony 
are more or less compatible with one another, though you're not really supposed to use Video 8 tapes in a Digital 8 machine or a Hi8 machine. I have certainly used them in a Digital 8 machine with acceptable results. And you can tell these cassettes are pretty nice looking stuff. These two, as best I remember it, have pretty boring meetings on them. And then there was a third tape with this camcorder that I don't know is still here, though it appears to be that actually contained someone's uh, house tour and Christmas movies. So that's about everything there is to say about this camcorder. We'll have a little demonstration of how this thing's recorded video and audio look here in just a moment. But before I get to that, let's talk about the much less common piece of this little video setup. Here is something you will definitely not see every day. This is an honest-to-goodness actual Sony Video 8 VCR. That's right, a standalone component type video cassette recorder that operates with videos made on Video 8 tapes. This machine is capable of playback and recording. Now there is an obvious reason why this thing exists. If we look at the sticker on the top, which is amazingly still intact and in pretty good shape after all of these years, you will see that there is a picture of an early Video 8 Handycam on here. In fact, you can see a unit that is the same as or very similar to this one demonstrated over on fellow YouTuber V West Life's channel. He found one of these that all these years later was still in perfect working condition and he used it to shoot some video. Well, if you own one of these, or if you've watched that video to get all the details on it, you'll know right away that this particular Handycam was only capable of recording. Now, it's entirely possible that electronic limitations of the time, as well as constraints on the size or even the cost of the device, might well have precluded Sony's putting a playback circuit and video outputs on this early Handycam. But I think there might have been another reason. I think this might have been a sort of Trojan horse effect, in that Sony was probably still, from the mid-1980s when this unit was produced, smarting from the smackdown of their Betamax format by the cheaper and much more popular VHS. Although when this unit was produced, which appears to have been in 1986 based on the date codes of the components inside, Sony definitely would have still been making a few Betamax machines, and so would the few manufacturers who had signed on to support the format at the time. My guess is that Sony hoped to make the Video 8 format more successful than Betamax had been, thus trying to upstage the already strongly established VHS format. Well, that certainly didn't happen. Video 8 did actually enjoy immense popularity in the home video and even the semi-professional video recording world. And Video 8 hung on for a long time with some technological advancements such as Hi8, which gave you better video resolution and was Sony's answer to VHS-C. And then ultimately, the so-called Digital 8 format, which I am actually recording this video on right now. I'm using a Sony DCR TRV280 Digital 8 Handycam to record this. And Digital 8 is, of course, exactly what it sounds like. It is a DV, or Digital Video Data Stream, that is recorded not to mini DV tape, but to 8mm video tape. Anyway, let's have a look at this machine. It is fully capable of recording and playing. It supports recording and playback at two speeds, both SP and LP. Obviously, you would choose SP because despite its reduced recording time, it would give you a better quality picture. LP, on the other hand, would give you the ability, as our little sticker friend says here on the top, to record for up to four hours. There's some other interesting stuff on this sticker. Sony tells us that this machine gives us the immediate playback of Handycam home movie. <laughs> I would say home movies, that's not entire, entirely grammatically correct. It also makes the dubious claim that this unit is electronically compatible with VHS and Beta VCRs. Well, yes and no. This thing would certainly operate on the same video standard of a VHS or a Beta VCR, so they could be connected to one another and you could even dub or play back tapes through the other machine depending upon how you wanted to how you wanted to move video around and even so to speak transcode it though you would have been more transferring it at the time. Transcoding is really a term that it refers to video activities in the digital world as far as I know. 
Another interesting claim made on this sticker is uh, the claim that the Video 8 format is a worldwide standard with 127 companies. Well, 127 companies what? First of all, I'm not sure there have ever been more than maybe 50 makers of video recording equipment in the whole world. Now down here, one certainly can't argue with the fact that this machine would have given you four hours worth of recording. I don't know about crystal clear stills and slow motion, other than to say that this unit does indeed support making still pictures in the same way that a VHS or Betamax machine would have done by engaging a slow playback mode where the tape moves more slowly across the head drum or by actually pausing the movement of the tape and leaving the head drum spinning. Easy timer setting? I would have to say that I agree with Sony on that. They went out of their way to make timer recording on this machine about as friendly as any I've ever seen. Now you might be wondering where the timer controls are. I'll show you right now. Some of them are up here. You can actually set the clock up here. You can configure the digital tuner. This is one of those odd sort of hybrid tuners that allowed you to specify a couple of different channels in each position and it also allowed you some controlling of the fine tuning. Up here you can set the recording mode, you can clear all the timer programs, and there are three timer positions that you get to choose with this slide switch over here. When you operate the slide switch, you can see that the red marking moves between one, two, and three. Down here you can also see controls for the slow and still adjustment, as well as a video sharpness control that can make the video either softer and blurrier, or sharper but with the potential to show more video artifacting and interference and then of course over here is a little round button that sets the clock once the clock is set and you'll see it in the clock display there you'll see the day of the week over here and the time now you'll notice that only one of the colons is flashing and there is a reason for that this is one of those little things that some Sony engineer undoubtedly paid quite a bit of attention to I don't know if anyone in the world would ever notice but the top colon, which should just now have started flashing, flashes during the top 30 seconds of the minute, whereas the bottom colon will flash during the last or bottom 30 seconds of any particular given minute. This is, of course, a vacuum fluorescent display. Now I take that back. I think this may be an LED display. <laughs> but nevertheless, you can see all the symbols in here with night shot on. You can see that there are three dots up here whose function I'm uncertain of. You can see the days of the week, no provision for a 24-hour clock. You can also see a smaller clock over here that's probably used when you're programming the stop time. And you can also see the entries for the digital tuning. Over here in the tape area, you can see the SP and EP notations. You can see four eights that are used for the counter. There's an indicator that says slow. Another tuning indicator over here, again with a cable TV provision. Another set of SP and LP indicators. VTR lights up when the RF modulator inside this unit is in use. And then finally there is a set of indicators down here, L, M, H, and U, that I have not seen come on, so I don't know what they do. By and large this is a well-built machine, but it seems that there is one flimsy thing about it, and that would be the timer setting controls. You'll notice I've got them taped shut here. That's because this door has an unfortunate tendency to fall open. And if you'll remember what I said just a moment ago about this thing's timer programming being, well, maybe friendly is too strong of a word, but it's certainly approachable. When you open this door down here, you'll notice that the display on the camera, on the camera, on the video machine, actually changes to a set of blanks and you are prompted to set the timer through three major steps. First you program the day, then you program the turn on time by entering hours and minutes. This would appear on the big display. So if we wanted to record something on say Monday at oh let's say nine o'clock in the morning we could do that and then we would tell it that the program ended at say ten o'clock and it would be on, oh, I don't know, channel 32 sounds as good as any, especially in this day when analog TV is almost completely obsolete. And then at the end here, you would press the timer record button, which it may complain bitterly about because there is no tape in it at the moment.
Yep, it wants a tape. Now the model number of this machine is no secret. If you've been watching the video carefully, you've seen it printed in at least two places already. This is Sony's EV-A80 model. And I suspect that this was, in all honesty, probably a rather low-end machine because of a few different things. First of all, the front panel control layout is pretty spare. There's not a whole lot of golly gee whiz toys that this thing offers or special functionality that it's capable of. Perhaps the remote would have offered more functions. The remote sensor is down there. But I don't know, as I didn't actually get the remote for this unit. In fact, I actually found this unit at a random thrift store in Missouri. It was marked $10, but they had a half price sale that day, so I came home with it for five. Anyway, as I was saying, I suspect that in the grand scheme of things, this was a rather low-end unit because it just doesn't have a lot of frills. I can't prove that because there aren't a whole lot of these things out there, and in fact, when I went to Sony's website and typed in that model number, nothing came up. Some kind person at Sony has scanned an awful lot of the manuals for their older products, including some of their clock radios, which, you know, a pretty pedestrian device like that, you'd think if they got those scanned, they would have found this in their archives as well. But it's entirely possible that everyone at Sony has forgotten about this little foray into Video 8 component style VCRs. But there is what you would expect to see on the back. There is an input for the VHF and UHF antenna. Unlike some older equipment, you'll notice that the input is via a single 75 ohm connection. Older equipment either use 300 ohm twin lead connections or sometimes they use the 75 ohm coaxial connection for VHF and the 300 ohm twin lead for UHF. But in this case, one connector does everything. Then there is an output over here. When this unit is off or it's not playing a videotape and the so-called VTR mode is disengaged, this simply passes through the incoming signal from the attached antenna if there is one. Again, you can control the uh, output of the RF modulator built into this unit. You can set it to either output on channel 3 or channel 4, whichever one is not used in your area or whichever one you don't happen to care about receiving when this unit is turned on and the VTR mode is engaged. You will notice that there is no corresponding input on this thing for a video and audio source, which is a surprising omission, and again, it suggests that this was a bottom-of-the-market model. There is, however, a composite video output as well as a monophonic audio output. There's a, there's a generous cabinet vent on the back. This unit never seems to get very hot when it's in operation. And rather interestingly, it does have an unswitched AC outlet on the back that can have a television set or some other piece of audio-visual equipment plugged into it. If you do have equipment with outlets like that, you certainly should not attempt to plug in something like your household vacuum cleaner because you may very well burn it up. Let's go ahead and have a look inside this unit. Here's what you'll find inside your average Sony Video 8 VCR. Back here, underneath the uh, vents that were in the cabinet, in fact, you can actually see the vents in the back there, is the power supply section, as you would expect. There's the line cord coming in here, connections to the auxiliary outlet, a power transformer, and what I would consider the high-voltage or line-connected board. Then there is the low-voltage, most probably line-isolated, power supply board. And there are a couple of major components on here. Looks like some transistors, a very impressive looking rectifier. That's the device with the silver fins on it. And then, as proof that they didn't have quite enough room to get everything they wanted to have on this board, they ran a little ribbon cable over here to a daughter card that has a cute little, and yes, I mean it is cute, STK module on it. This is an STK5362. And more likely than not, it is a multi-output voltage regulator because a device like this would need a couple of different major voltages for everything that's doing. Now you'll notice the head drum spinning there. That's right, I've been pointing out the internals of this thing including some line connected stuff with it plugged in. Don't try that at home kids. If you catch something on fire it's your own fault and I will not be responsible for it. So be intelligent. Use your brain. Don't do what UXW Bill does because you could get hurt in some cases. There was a copious quantity of dust in here Everything else, which didn't have vent louvers over it, was pretty clean. 
And you can see that while there's certainly still plenty going on in this system, this unit is new enough that miniaturization and cheapening of the major working components, to be less charitable about it, had started to take place. Now, as found, this particular unit did not work. I put a videotape in it after recording it on the Handycam over there, and all I got out of this thing was no audio and noise. I figured that something had to be working because the tape appeared to be running just fine. It didn't look like it was suffering from bad belts. And what's more, if I played with the pause button or the rewind and fast forward functions, occasionally a picture would break through. The cure ended up being very, very simple. As you can guess, this machine had filthy, dirty video heads. Now in this case, with Video 8, the tape arrangement is a little bit different. There is no audio and control head. Everything is done through this singular helical scanning head right here. And it's very ingenious how Sony pulled some of that stuff off without using the typical control head topology that a VHS or possibly even a Betamax machine would have used. You can read more about that online if you're interested in knowing it. Meanwhile, that's about everything there is to say about this thing. So I think it's time to pop the cover back on here, put a tape in this thing, and have a little live demonstration of how it looks, how it sounds, and how it works. Now, as a sort of little sidebar, you might be wondering just how it is that one gets video from an old device such as this into the modern world. There are certainly plenty of ways to do it, but this is the way that I have found to work particularly well. Specifically, what I do is I connect the video and audio outputs of the Video 8 VCR, or any old analog piece of video equipment, to a set of AV patch cables. Now here, in order to solve the problem of having a device with a stereophonic audio input and a source that only outputs monophonic audio, I have a Y plug. All of this cabling in turn goes to another junction point here and an adapter cable that allows me to plug things in to the analog video input of this, the DCR TRV27 Mini DV Handycam. If you watched my video on this camera, you will know that this is capable of performing real time transcoding of an analog video source into a DV data stream. So you can see that I have. The, audio, the analog video connection made here. I have the DV connection made here. And then it is a simple matter of starting the VCR playing. And in a moment, I would see the result pouring in to the computer. Of course, it really does figure that I would run into some kind of a snag while I'm demonstrating this to you on video. And in fact, I did. The iMovie video window actually showed up blank. But here you can see some of the video that I have previously captured after shooting it with the camera, playing it back on this VCR, converting it with this camcorder, and then finally capturing it in iMovie 06 or iMovie HD, depending on which you prefer to call it. This is a test of the Sony Handycam CCD TR91 Video 8 camcorder. Here I am just shooting some random test video of things in the kitchen.
Now, as you can see, my mother's been cleaning the oven. And I think that as of late, there was something I was supposed to do with the oven. Oh, that's right. I was supposed to replace the light bulb. I mean, you wonder if I didn't break that. <laughs> but at least it will have, in just a moment here. Okay. A nice new light bulb. As you can see, the glass lens, although it had a bit of a fall there, is perfectly fine. So we'll go ahead and fasten the little metal strap that holds it back into place. You're probably really supposed to disconnect the oven from power when you do it. But for all of you that were asking me to replace the light bulb in my mother's oven, it has now been done. And here is video proof. On the bottom screen. And here's a little bit of an outdoor test with the CCD TR91 Handycam. As you can see, in case you've ever wondered about it, there's the Blog TV outdoor camera in all of its cheap Chinese glory. And you can see basically what it looks out upon there in the street. The concrete lion, a wind chime, and some other things out here in the yard today. Thank you for watching, and feel free to leave a comment if you have one.